You're listening to Classic Business, which is brought to you by Liberty. I'm busy reading Douglas Kruger's relentlessly relevant 50 ways to innovate, and perhaps it's the fact that my wife is in the early stages of establishing a business or that the topic of innovation is just one of those subjects that's quite hard to encapsulate, but I'm finding it an absolutely fascinating and refreshing take on the subject. It could also be the fact that Douglas Kruger writes it in a way that uh, really endears, it invites you in, it leaves the jargon and snobbery at the door, and uh, as he says in the opening chapters, it helps you uh, take the red pill to continue down the rabbit hole and see the matrix for all of those matrix fans i think you'll understand the reference douglas welcome to classic business thank you very much yes absolutely now michael jordan uh no introduction needed i think calls the book an innovation in itself because it looks beyond the buzz and the hype around the word and it's high praise indeed and i think well deserved from the beginning here what led you to devote an entire book to the subject Uh, you're an avid reader for one and it has very much become something of a corporate buzzword and an area of interest over the last 10, 10 15 years. Uh, but I think the danger is that a lot of the time people buy into the notion that they should innovate. But then we get to the how do you, and I think that's where things start to fall apart. And um, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And that's precisely what I've tried to do. I've tried to take a, a very complex topic, a very uh, difficult-to-access idea, and really break it down to simple levers. And in fact, to say, how do you, how do you take, where where is the end of the ball of string? How do you begin to do it, uh, regardless of the size of your organization? And uh, I think right in the beginning, you you take this conversation that you had with your wife over a glass of wine, uh, uh, a woman after my own heart in that regard, um, (laughs) and uh, you really uh, explain quite neatly, because I think the innovation is one of those, as you say, it's one of those fuzzy kind of concepts on a business strategy perspective that we struggle to define. But you found a way to say, we zoom out, have a high level look at things and start connecting the dots. Tell me about that. And the, the conversation in the kitchen that you mentioned, uh, it's almost the entire book given away in a single page. What happened literally was my wife said, all right, what's the book about? And I said, well, you know, for goodness sake, I've spent months on the thing, and it's, uh, it takes content from various other uh, books and South African business leaders and so on. And she said, yes, but tell me what it's all about. Uh, and in about 45 seconds a minute, I, I then summed up essentially how innovation works. And to my surprise, it is actually possible to do that. Um, and it's a, it's a very sort of simple case of, as you um, into that, zooming back from process because we get so bogged down in how we do what we do every day. Uh, and then asking simple questions like, what are we actually trying to achieve? And the question, what are we trying to achieve, will yield very different results uh, to the specific questions we ask every day when we're operational. And it's just different patterns of thinking and the courage to see them through to completion. In fact, quite a large part of the book really deals with the, uh, the human psychology, the fear aspect of trying to drive an idea in the face of a thousand no's. And in fact, I, uh, I recently got done reading the, uh, the new Elon Musk book, which I, I must say I highly recommend. It's, it's and, on uh, my desk and uh, on my list. Mm, <laughs> it's, it's a brilliant one. The audible uh, audio version is just as good, I must say. Um, and he is a, really a paramount example, and of course a South African-born innovator, of a man who faced knows on a level that we just, I mean, we cannot comprehend, Mm. and nevertheless pushed through. So quite often, the, the bigger part of innovation is the courage to keep at it. The courage to keep at it and also the courage to follow the path less trodden because it's a, another golden thread that I find runs through the book. The fact that we uh, have this middle class fixation with that trodden path, the kind of conventional yes. two and a half kids, house in the suburbs, pension, study, you know, get a good job, retire, the die. Script. The inherited script. And it's only once we start questioning that inherited script that we actually start seeing um, the matrix, for lack of a better word. <laughs> And in fact, um, yeah, as, as you'll know from, uh, from looking at the book, my own starting point was uh, a youth in which I grew up, uh, not, not desperately poor, but a little bit poorer than the kids around me in a middle-class neighborhood. And uh, the result of that, you know, at the time, you, you feel a little bit sorry for yourself that you can't have the things people around you can have. Mm. But the difference in thinking that was instilled in me as a result uh, has really stood me in good stead and, and was the, the cornerstone and the basis for this book. And it's... It, um, it's sort of building out from that idea. The notion then is different patterns of thinking coming from different cultures, backgrounds, and different levels of struggle are massively useful to the world of innovation. Mm. The, the more rigidly we adhere to the sort of middle class script, exactly as you've just described it, the less creatively we think. 
So it's often the hardships and the difficulties we've gone through that really inform our ability to see around uh, around corners, to see different angles, to think about things in more creative ways. Mm, and uh, you were fortunate, uh, as was I, to have uh, parents that really instilled the love of reading in you from a very Absolutely. young age. And reading a, a broad range. You know, we don't all have to be avid, uh, kind of uh, non-fiction, autobiographical kind of, uh, you know, textbook mm. MBA readers. We can read everything from Dr. Zeus to Stephen King. It's about broadening that uh, uh, horizon and, and wellspring of knowledge. And it's important that we do that. And the example that I give is that if you ask an engineer for a solution, you're going to get an engineering solution. However, if you ask uh, an architect or an artist or a tattoo artist or your four-year-old for a solution, you're going to get a very different perspective. And the practical uh, lesson we learn out of that is that the more technically minded you are within a very narrow field, the less able you are to solve broad-level problems. And I give the example of uh, James Cameron, who is the, uh, uh, the guy who came up with Avatar and Titanic, yes. the, the two most famous uh, or successful movies of all time. And he actually talks about how he doesn't use a single technical skill that he learned at the beginning of his career. What he continues to use is the ability to think broadly. Mm. So it's really the, the creativity and the soft skills that we tend to underestimate that actually make us leaders in an industry. Um, and that's then backed up by various studies, like uh, one of the ones is, uh, I refer to a book called Excellent Sheep by William Dereshevitz. Uh, and he makes a very strong case for the idea that studying too narrow a technical field actually stops us thinking creatively. We do need certain tech skills, but we also need to be able to think around them. And mm. that's where the soft skills, uh, skills come in, the creativity, the leadership public speaking skills, uh, ways of looking at things differently. It all makes a very strong case uh, for arts, for the humanities, uh, for studying the the, the kind of politics, philosophy, economics type degrees out there. And Mm. uh, I I really think in today's world where we seem to have a a fixation in business for kind of outcomes oriented uh, education, that this is a a really good example of why we need uh, the arts. Now, in terms of brands, because this is also a strong uh, marketing brand focused book you say that the old brands are failing to grasp something about innovation and it it's about remaining relevant to today's consumers i mean uh, they're almost dinosaurs in a way absolutely and in fact i call this one the meteorite strike that no one noticed i think it's one of the most important discoveries in our business um, sphere over the course of say the last 10 15 years and it's not broadly being spoken about it's a study that came out last year that uh, found that On the whole, South African consumers are not responding well at all to the idea of legacy. And they are responding incredibly well to how you are innovating into my life today. And uh, it's very interesting. If you just listen to, say, uh, ads on the radio, you'll hear and quickly pick out the brands that are self-referential, that talk about their legacy, their importance, their world. And the study says it's leaving consumers cold in South Africa. What we need to be doing is talking about how I change things for you today. Uh, and, of course, it's not just talking about. We need to be doing something about that as well. So the, the, the sort of the short version of that one is legacy is no longer working. Innovation mm. is. Mm. And, and brands that you do reference, the things like uh, BMW, sheer driving pleasure, are those ones that aren't so self-referential, as you say, but play on the emotional experience. And that's really where consumers are plugging in. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, the uh, the marketing manager of BMW South Africa was kind enough to give quite a considerable amount of input into the book. And I put that to him. I said, how is it possible that in the same year that the study found that legacy is is leaving us cold, BMW, which is a a brand that's almost exactly 100 years old, and therefore, uh, in theory, is a legacy brand, how did you win coolest brand of the year? Yes. And he smiled for a moment and he sort of said, well, the clue is in the tagline. It's sheer driving pleasure. And implied in that is your sheer driving pleasure. So exactly as you say, they're not self-referential. Uh, they're talking about what we do in your universe, your feelings, your life, your world. And really, that's, uh, they're clearly doing it correctly. Mm, well, clearly. Uh, and Guy Kilfoyle is um, well referenced in the book. Uh, very interesting indeed. Douglas is... An instance, though, uh, or a few instances, I should say, where brands would be well advised perhaps not to go and innovate. Here be dragons, so to speak. And I think Subaru is a good example of this. Subaru is a fascinating one. Uh, One of the strange quirks about the way in which you market yourself is that the more focused you are on a very specific target market, uh, quite often the broader your appeal tends to be. 
And very uh, quite frequently, and in the case of Subaru, this is an interesting one, marketers tend to miss this one. Now, the short version of this story in Subaru's case is um, a while ago, they discovered that their hardcore rally cars were really appealing to the mom's taxi market. So what they did, and herein lies the error, is they started saying South Africa's favorite mom's taxi. Now, the reason the moms were buying them as taxis is because they were hardcore rally cars. Uh, the second you start actually changing and softening the marketing message, what you will tend to see in a case like that is usually a spike up for a year or two and then a drop off and a decline in sales afterwards. The reason being that the brand becomes dissipated. Mm. So uh, while, while they haven't exactly committed brand suicide there, uh, they're on, on dangerous grounds. Back to innovation here, and there was something that really struck me in the book when you were talking about open innovation. It reminded me of an interview that I conducted with the the CEO of the Hyperloop uh, last week. And what really struck me about the Hyperloop business, I mean, besides the technology and and the feat of being able to travel between cities at almost the speed of sound, was Mm. the actual business model. Now, um, uh, Hyperloop Technologies is crowdsourcing the the design. So basically using a global R&D team, using... um, technology and offering them equity in the business so it's not open source but it's just phenomenal to think that with almost zero overheads you can assemble the world's best and brightest engineers to all work on a project of this scale globally and uh, that really reminded me of when you were talking about open innovation and the way the world of R&D is changing. Absolutely and it's, it's astonishing that we still cling to the idea that our people, our tribe, our staff, our employees have to have the ideas. Ideas are now a, a, a global asset. You can fish for them wherever they happen to be. And I mean, we as South African business owners and entrepreneurs really need to expand our thinking a little bit and get beyond the notion that I have to hire someone uh, in Rudaput if my business is in Rudaput, in Phantom if I'm in Phantom, and so on. Uh, and to start actually thinking, we have a species worth of ideas out there, and they are all accessible to the person who's willing to go fishing on a bigger level. And it's a bit of a shift in thinking. It is. And, um, you know, to borrow a quote from the book, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The, the <laughs> unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. And therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. So Absolutely. why don't we see more unreasonable men then, Douglas? Because we are hell-bent on training the script. Uh, and that, was, in fact, was our starting point for our discussion. Our, our uh, schooling system, our culture, everything to do with the way in which we raise people toward the working world is geared toward creating basically compliant automatons. Uh, you know, at the risk of sounding like something of a hippie, I'm, I'm not hugely anti-establishmentarian. Um, but what? The, the really the <laughs> <laughs> uh, that came through in the book, I must say, uh, Douglas. Oh, did it? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to take ownership and say, all right, then I, then I guess I have. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly go out and get the bell bottoms and grow the beard. <laughs> um, but, but yes, we are so um, so strongly focused on replicating the script mm-hmm. that we really don't try to encourage different ways of thinking, different ways of looking at the world around us. And I think that's where the danger begins. And the, the subtle social pressures are largely invisible to us. And I give the example of, um, say, a, uh, an 18th or 19th century Industrial Revolution era building, a factory. And you take a look at how these things actually operate and the way in which uh, workers are led, uh, a whistle is blown, they're led to their workstations during the day and so on, and you draw parallels to how a modern school works, and it's actually frightening. That's not to pick on schools, but the point is to show that the the kind of thinking that is handed down to us, inherited thinking, is Mm. invisible to us. We don't question why a school looks the way it does, and there actually is a reason. It's designed to grow the appropriate kind of employee for an 18th century Industrial Revolution era factory. But we're not questioning that because we don't see it. Well, that's uh, just one of the fascinating insights from the book, Douglas. Before I let you go, you end off in the final chapter with 50 ways or ideas to really spur innovation. And I'll I'll let you end off sharing. I'm not going to go through all 50, but share your favorite one. My favorite one is what I call burn down the building. Uh, and this is the one that I, I love to talk about because it's just it's, it's such an interesting idea. It's a thought exercise you can do with any size company. Get your team together and tell them, all right, the building has burnt down. We have lost the mechanism by which we service our customers. Everything that physically used to go into uh, so serving the customers that we serve is now gone. Tomorrow, we have to start serving the same customers with the same basic idea, but we cannot use anything we used yesterday. How do we do it? 
And the idea there is that you spur uh, different ways of thinking about the same solution. And it also brings to light uh, threats. If anybody else is able to spot a different way to do what you do, then that is a massive threat to your business. However, if you think of it first, you can get to market first. You become the radical disruptor. Douglas Kruger, author of Relentlessly Relevant 50 Ways to Innovate, a book that will forever alter your doors of perception and help you radically disrupt those around you. And that's a wrap for Classic Business this week, from retirement reform to innovation, from uber disruptive technologies and book reviews to new sustainable operating business models. It's been one of those weeks, a really great week, bringing you the stories that are shaping business every day. Next week, the investment panels turn passive investing into an aggressive art form with liberty carrie adams is up next with your weekly case of classic wine from me michael producer jono adams and sound engineer mdu tele thank you for tuning in have a great weekend and see you again on monday for the business brought to you by liberty